Hi, I'm Judith Goff, 71, and I'm recording this from Desert Hot Springs, California. My name is Pedro Nogues. I'm 40 years old, and I live in Mexico City. The AIDS crisis is part of our history as an LGBT plus community. Thank you, Michael, for doing this uh, story called The Plague. What an apt name. My name is Sean Dorenzo. I'm 40 years old, and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm responding to David's comments in this episode about not being able to leave the Catholic Church. Hi, my name is Ed. I'm 41, calling from Toronto, Canada. And I've been thinking a lot about Father Nichols's question on the third episode. My name is Javier Monticel. I'm 30 years old, and I live outside of Boston, Massachusetts. So I came across Plague, the podcast, through social Hello, my name is John Mandel. I'm 62 years old, and I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. My oldest brother, Dan, died of AIDS in 1984 at the age of 33. Dan was always uh, growing up a religious person. He my name is Mary Christian. I am 67 years old, and I live in southwest Virginia. The early 80s were a frightening time in the AIDS crisis, yet I remain thankful that through those difficult times, God opened my eyes and allowed me to see. From America Media, I'm Michael O'Loughlin, and this is Plague, Untold Stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church. As you just heard, we received a lot of listener feedback on the podcast. And as we wrap up Plague, we want to respond to a few questions and comments that came up several times. So far, we focused on the past, the 1980s and 90s, when HIV and AIDS was killing tens of thousands of Americans each year. This was a time when circumstances forced the institutional church and the LGBT community to confront one another in unprecedented ways. But what about today? That's what this episode, the last in the series, will be about. More after the break. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org. The first question comes from a fellow Catholic journalist and writer who's curious about squaring the church's continued presence in places hard hit by AIDS with its prohibition on condoms when it comes to fighting the spread of HIV. This is Jamie Manson from New York. I love the Plague podcast so much, but I think the content begs one question, and that is that AIDS is still very much a pandemic. 34 million people are still suffering with it. A million people in sub-Saharan Africa alone die from it every year. And we still have a church that bans condoms. So how do you reconcile this church that is such an incredible force for good and for charity, but yet is also still such an instrument of harm in its ban on contraception and its ban on many forms of sex education. How have you been able to reconcile those two aspects of this church? Jamie's question is similar to other comments we heard from listeners who expressed admiration for the church's work, but also concern over the church's ban on condoms and fighting the spread of HIV. To help get answers, I turned to two Catholics, a bishop and a sister, who have grappled with similar questions in their own work. Globally, HIV and AIDS is still a crisis, and perhaps no place has been hit harder than South Africa, as PBS reported in 2016. South Africa has more people infected with HIV than any nation on Earth. Over six million people here have the virus. Only half of those people are being treated, so South Africa also has one of the greatest challenges. The HIV and AIDS crisis in South Africa began as it did elsewhere, affecting primarily gay men. 
But it quickly spread to the general population at a particularly chaotic time in the nation's history. As the country fully transitioned from apartheid to democracy in the 1990s, government officials largely ignored the problem. They focused instead on the difficult work of nation building. In the early days of South Africa's HIV and AIDS crisis, the Catholic Church stepped in to provide care. But not without controversy, even within the Church's own ranks. In South Africa and around the world, the Catholic Church is one of the biggest providers of HIV and AIDS care. And for some people, that's controversial because the Church does not approve the use of condoms, which the Centers for Disease Control says can prevent the spread of HIV. When it comes to Catholics struggling with the Church's prohibition on condoms to help stop the spread of HIV and AIDS, Jamie isn't alone. For a perspective from someone who's been working on the ground for decades, I called up Bishop Kevin Dowling. I am a South African-born redemptress priest and became Bishop of the Diocese of Rustenburg in South Africa in January 1991. And I've lived here uh, ever since, so almost 29 years in this diocese. Bishop Dowling says poverty in his region is high. Many people live in temporary houses that surround the world's largest platinum mines. There are challenges with violence and crime. We spoke via Skype because he hasn't had a phone since 2009. He said people kept stealing the electrical and phone wiring connected to the mission where he lives to sell it for scrap. This happens uh, frequently. Uh, The electricity lines are stolen because those who steal this can sell that and get money and survive. Eventually, the phone company simply refused to install new equipment. So instead, he relies on a modem, which cuts out often. That's why some of the audio here is a little scratchy. It's estimated that about one in four people in Rustenburg have HIV. Bishop Dowling said he learned about the public health crisis firsthand many years ago when he visited one of the mining camps where most of the residents live. He remembers one young woman in particular. One day with tears pouring down her eyes, she said, Father, I have no hope. I'm dying. And my fear is that I will die before my baby dies. That is what broke my heart. And that is why I, I worked night and day to develop a program in these shack settlements, these poorest communities, where we as church would be involved in creating a program to care for the sick and the dying. One of the drivers of the HIV and AIDS crisis in South Africa is related to the conditions at the platinum mines. Single young men from all around the region move to Rustenburg for work. Vulnerable young women, who are often very poor, also move to the area. The results can be deadly, as a South African Catholic sister described it to me. The most vulnerable group today, as opposed to 20, 30 years ago, is teenage girls. That's Sister Alison Munro. She's a Dominican sister of Oakford and an HIV and AIDS educator. But teenage girls are not being infected by teenage boys, by and large. They are being infected by men in their 30s and older, some of whom are married. Um, so these men often sort of pick up these girls on the sideline. They give them money, you know, favors in return for sex. And it becomes very difficult for the girls, for example, to look for help. Sister Monroe headed the Catholic Church's response to HIV and AIDS in Southern Africa for almost 20 years. She told me that she started working in HIV and AIDS care back when mostly gay men were affected, and that she saw how the epidemic spread quickly to the general population. Back when the government wasn't providing public health resources, Sister Allison said the church opened hospices, homes for some of the millions of children orphaned by AIDS, and clinics for HIV testing. Bishop Dowling and Sister Monroe worked together in fighting HIV and AIDS in South Africa. He shares her view that young women are particularly vulnerable today. So you have this lethal combination of single women, single mothers, poor, extremely poor, desperate, single minors who have money and can pay 
therefore, for sexual liaisons, and that has uh, precipitated the epidemic in this area. The woman Bishop Dowling met told him again and again about violence and coercion they experienced from the miners. Many said they felt they had no choice when it came to sex. It was the only way they could survive. They saw contracting HIV as part of the deal. The question about the church's ban on condoms and its work in HIV and AIDS has been around since the beginning of the epidemic. Though in some ways, the debate has changed a bit since the 1980s. Like in 2010, as CBS News reported. The Vatican this morning is broadening comments made by Pope Benedict about condoms. The comments came in his new book, which is called The Light of the World. It went on sale this morning. In it, the Pope says condoms may be morally justified in certain situations, such as with male prostitutes, to prevent the spread of HIV. The Vatican later clarified that Pope Benedict did not condone the use of condoms as the solution to the HIV and AIDS crisis, but in certain cases could be justified as a first step to save a person's life. But his comments seemed more theoretical than practical. Some Catholics working in HIV and AIDS care, including Bishop Dowling, say more has to change on the ground, particularly around education. He said he supports programs that promote changes in behavior that could slow the spread of HIV. But when it comes to the most vulnerable, women coerced into prostitution, he believes providing education about condoms and access to them is a pro-life issue. Women are extremely vulnerable. This is an extremely violent society. Gender-based violence is a huge issue in this country. Bishop Dowling said, quote, men are the problem when it comes to slowing the spread of HIV. He said the church supports programs that teach men that women are, quote, not objects to be used and abused. Still, he said he's been questioned about his views on the role condoms play in slowing the spread of HIV. Like the time a few years ago when a journalist asked him about his position. I said, to me, this is a pro-life issue. A pro-life issue. Not a pro-birth issue. A pro-life issue. That this woman is in danger of being infected by the HIV virus is in danger of being impregnated and giving birth to a child who will be HIV positive as well. And the prospect for them at that time were a horrible death. I said, the only way through education with these women is to empower them to make choices with these men that I will give you sex on condition that you use a condom. That was the only way she could save her life. That was the issue for me. Bishop Dowling says his view that condoms can be moral in some situations is not shared widely by other bishops. In 2001, a group of bishops from Southern Africa considered a proposal from Bishop Dowling to relax their stance against condoms in fighting HIV. Here's how South African Cardinal Wilfred Napier, the Archbishop of Durban, articulated his position at the time. Abstain and be faithful is the human and the Christian way of overcoming (laughs) HIV and AIDS. Abstain from sex before marriage and be faithful to your spouse in marriage. This is the answer which Christ gives us. Many people, and especially governments, promote condoms for preventing AIDS. This is a matter of deep concern for us in the church. The bishops regard the widespread and indiscriminate promotion of condoms as an immoral and misguided weapon in our battle against HIV AIDS. In the end, Bishop Dowling's proposal was rejected. Then in 2011, the Vatican held a major HIV and AIDS conference. Some public health advocates hoped the church would further nuance its stance on condoms as they relate to HIV prevention. Because, as PBS reported at the time, The church is one of the biggest providers of HIV-AIDS care in the world, with more than 117,000 health facilities worldwide. But certain voices were not present at the meeting. Kevin Dowling is a Catholic bishop who wasn't invited to the Vatican conference. 
We spoke with him last week as he met patients. Ultimately, no updates were made to the church's stance on the use of condoms. Speakers urged rich nations to provide more aid for health care for poorer nations, encouraged monogamy, and suggested couples abstain from sex when one partner has HIV. But Bishop Dowling says he is confident that the Catholics working in the field, including sisters, do what they think will help protect women. Sister Monroe said that the Catholic health ministries in South Africa came to a sort of compromise around condoms. Condoms was a huge controversy. We had to negotiate how to address the question of condoms where the government wanted to throw condoms at everybody, including school children. It reminded me of the compromise the sisters at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York made in the 1980s, which you heard about in episode two. The argument was basically this. The church's healthcare centers were not challenging church teaching against condoms as a form of birth control, but they wanted their clients to know about condoms as a way of effectively stopping the spread of a virus. So we had to make the argument that we were not looking at pregnancy, we were looking at um, helping not to transmit the virus from one person to another. The Catholic Church still plays a role in fighting HIV and AIDS in South Africa. But in recent years, the government has stepped up its own efforts. It now funds the largest antiretroviral drug program in sub-Saharan Africa. In response to better public health campaigns, Catholic organizations shifted their focus. Today, church-affiliated groups focus on HIV testing and then connect people who test positive to public clinics where they can receive drug regimens. But that's easier said than done. Education is critical, and that's where Catholic agencies put their efforts today. Bishop Dowling says he supports campaigns seeking to change behavior. He just thinks that they don't do enough on their own to protect vulnerable women. And despite this fairly controversial view for a Catholic bishop, he remains a bishop in good standing. He's 75 years old, the age when all Catholic bishops are required to submit their resignations. But Pope Francis did not immediately act on Bishop Dowling's resignation. Instead, he asked him to stay on. Hi, this is Steve Rivera. I'm executive director of Project Lazarus in New Orleans. Back in the 1980s, the way Project Lazarus started was during a time of great fear. Today we see a diverse population that is still primarily or majority LGBT and primarily people of color from disadvantaged communities. Many structural and social issues still impact people living with HIV in New Orleans, and the need is still very strong for support. There is still a great need. Like Steve, other listeners pointed out that even though the worst of the HIV and AIDS epidemic seems to be behind us in the United States, it's not over. In the late 1990s, a new combination of drugs appeared to slow what was once a death sentence. People who took the drugs said they were a miracle, One day they were skeletal and on death's door, and the next they were back to feeling better. Challenges certainly remained, but HIV was on its way to becoming a chronic but manageable condition. This change had a big impact on Catholic HIV and AIDS ministry. Many of the organizations that began in the 80s and 90s shut down, or like Bethany Place from the last episode, they became independent, no longer tied to the church. At Most Holy Redeemer, the parish you heard about in Episode 4, the AIDS support group is once again meeting. It's smaller now, and it focuses on something that seemed impossible in the early days of the crisis, the challenges of aging while living long-term with HIV. In the United States, a future in which HIV is no longer transmitted might not be that far off, as CBS News reported in 2019. A new federal initiative aims to end the HIV epidemic in the U.S. The goal? reduce new infections by at least 90% over 10 years. 
Government health officials say ending the epidemic is possible, but it's only going to happen. The Centers for Disease Control says every American should be tested for HIV at least once, and those at greater risk should be tested more frequently. Drugs can make it virtually impossible to pass on HIV, but making people aware of their status and getting them on treatment is essential. But it is possible. Even though there is hope, there's still work to be done. In fact, new diagnoses of HIV in some parts of the U.S. remain stubbornly high. In 2017, more than 38,000 Americans were diagnosed with HIV. The most vulnerable groups are men who have sex with men in communities of color. To help me understand the challenges that remain, I met with John Fuller. He's a Jesuit priest as well as a medical doctor. Most of my patients don't know that I'm um, also a priest. Uh, it, it's not something that I would bring up to them. I, I think it could be a distancing topic. I need to have them be comfortable if I ask about sexual activity, drugs, and so on. Sometimes my patients will tell each other <laughs> this in the waiting room, but it, it comes up very, very little of the time. His early training was in the 1980s in San Francisco. Today, Father Fuller is on the clinical faculty of the Center for Infectious Diseases at Boston Medical Center. I spoke to him in his office near Boston College High School. When I asked him what he wanted people to know about HIV and AIDS in the U.S. today, he said emphatically that it's a mistake to think the crisis is over. If there's one group that I feel that society in general and perhaps the church also have not recognized as being at special risk, and that's young gay men from minority communities who have probably the highest incidence of new infections, at least in this country and in many countries around the world. He said one of the issues he sees in his own practice is that younger people don't have the same history with the crisis. There is a sense, because these young men who never saw the tremendous destruction, the physical deformity that came with those early years, who, because of their ignorance of the epidemic, feel that this is no big deal to catch HIV. I just need to go to the clinic and get a shot, and this will all be fine. And they don't understand that HIV is not like getting syphilis or getting gonorrhea, which, yes, can be treated. HIV is yours for life, and it will change everything that you are able to do and how you think of the world. We heard from people in earlier episodes who said that when they were diagnosed with HIV in the 80s and 90s, there was a stigma associated with it, even in the gay community. This could lead to isolation and depression. But Father Fuller said that today, some of his patients report finding community among others living with HIV, community that was elusive to them as a closeted LGBT person. For people in minority communities for whom being gay is just one more layer of, of being stigmatized, this is so isolating that sometimes a subset of that group actually wants to become infected in order to, be, to belong, mm. to be a part of, of this HIV phenomenon, to be a part of the HIV community. And that's tragic because no one is done a favor by becoming HIV infected. Father Fuller is a unique figure in the history of the church's response to HIV and AIDS. As a Catholic priest who's also a medical doctor, who's been working in HIV and AIDS medicine since the beginning, he's paid particularly close attention to the church's response. He said it stumbled a bit early on, but eventually it figured out the key to successful ministry was found in listening to those people living with HIV and AIDS. I'd say the early response was fearful, uncomfortable, unfamiliar, and not sure of what foot it should put forward first. It naturally enough put out a doctrinal foot and I think didn't do so well doing that. But eventually when it was truest to itself by becoming immersed in the experience and listening to the experience, um, it realized that there was more there than met the eye and that there was more that we had to learn to be our best selves in that situation. 
Hi, Michael. This is Steven from San Francisco, California, and I'm 25. I absolutely love your podcast. I love the way... We receive lots of listener emails with stories from the height of the HIV and AIDS crisis. But even more listeners sent messages with questions and comments about LGBT issues and the Catholic Church today. People shared their own experiences and asked me about mine. And so I just want to know, has this podcast really assisted you in learning how to navigate your life as a gay Catholic? As I thought about Stephen's question, my mind went to the conversations I had with LGBT Catholics who lived through this tumultuous time in history. Because reporting on Catholicism and LGBT issues sometimes makes me feel we're in unsettled and uncharted waters. Questions about sexuality and spirituality are swirling on says he's worried about homosexuality in the priesthood. The promotion of same-sex unions is in conflict Gay with rights Catholic activists teaching. are applauding what they're calling a shift by the Catholic Church toward homosexual people. Francis surprised the world today reaching out to the gay community in a way the Catholic Church... After the school refused to fire a teacher who is in a same-sex marriage... Gays have gifts to offer the church. And the threat of losing their Catholic now, affiliation. Many feel the Pope's comments signal change is finally coming. Sometimes it's not clear to me how to stay afloat. But as I've crisscrossed the country, spending hundreds of hours with dozens of people who lived through the height of the HIV and AIDS epidemic in the U.S., I realize there is a vast amount of wisdom waiting to be shared. As a gay Catholic, these stories are my history. But finding them hasn't been easy. We aren't taught them in our families, and we don't learn about them at church. I met many older LGBT people who lamented that cross-generational friendships are uncommon, They said they don't have young people to whom they can pass on these stories. I've been fortunate to meet people who embarked on this journey a couple of decades before me and who have something to say about what it means to be gay and Catholic today. Stephen, who you just heard from, said the podcast has been, quote, a blessing for me as a gay black Catholic who is not out to my family yet. He added, quote, I'm learning so much and my fears about myself are going away. Stephen told me he was particularly moved by Father Bill McNichols, whose story you heard in episode three. I think if you're gay, you get used to rejection for what you are. In some ways, don't you think? It made him think about what it takes to live an authentic life, as Bill chose to do back in the 1980s. This really speaks to myself because as a Catholic who is also gay and who is navigating how to live and what my life is going to look like, from now on beforehand and even now I really have to look at and things I'm sacrificing what am I sacrificing sometimes it's out of fear of oh no if I'm more open about my orientation or identity is that going to cost me something more like my vocation am I going to lose friends or family I think these are real questions that LGBT Catholics think about all the time. One thing became clear early on in my reporting. There is so much fear around the issue of LGBT people in the church. A lay church worker wrote in to say how meaningful he found the stories in Plague, but expressed anger that he was not able to speak publicly about his own experience because he feared he'd lose his job. Some priests and sisters shared private stories with me about their own experiences during the HIV and AIDS crisis. Incredibly compassionate examples of walking alongside the LGBT community during this difficult time. But they didn't want to go on the record because the topic can still be so divisive. This fear sometimes feels justified. There's a small but emboldened movement that uses the power of social media to harass and condemn LGBT Catholics and their supporters. The smallest acts of kindness toward LGBT Catholics are weaponized. And I was reluctant to put the people who shared their stories with me into that line of fire. Plus, I felt pressure to make sure we got this right. Did we capture the complexities of the stories? Did we allow space for individuals to speak for themselves, even if they might make some listeners uncomfortable? Did we do justice to the LGBT community's legitimate demands for recognition of their civil rights? And did we acknowledge the real debate going on within the Catholic Church about how to respond to challenging theological questions? 
There was a temptation to wrap up each episode neatly, to draw clear lessons and say who was right and who was wrong. But we did our best to resist that temptation, to let these powerful stories speak for themselves, to sit with their complexity, to acknowledge that more than one experience can be true at the same time. But there was one takeaway from nearly every interview I conducted. Cliff Morrison, the nurse from San Francisco who helped transform Most Holy Redeemer Parish. There was a lot of crying, there was a lot of grief, but it's one of the things I'm really proud about. David Pace, the early gay men's health crisis volunteer who fought for his place in the church. I'm going to stay, I'm going to fight, I'm going to make it a safer place for all of God's people. Sister Karen Helfenstein, the St. Vincent's Hospital Administrator who listened to a suffering community. And what can we learn to do better tomorrow? Each of them, and dozens of others whose stories didn't make it into the series, told me how they were tempted to give in to fear, but refused. Stephen asked if the experience of making this podcast has helped me to navigate life as a gay Catholic. I'll answer with this. I've written essays and given talks over the years about LGBT issues in the Catholic Church. And nearly every time, I've struggled with, should I use them or us? I almost always went with them. But as I reported this series and met so many LGBT people who refused to give in to fear, I dropped the them and switched to us. And I'm grateful that this podcast provided space for me to report on my community, to capture some of our history, and to complicate the narrative a bit. One final observation. What I'll remember when I listen to the stories of people who came face to face with individuals experiencing immense suffering, people who had to choose to live authentically when so much was at stake, is this. They didn't give in to fear. They chose love. Plague, Untold Stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church is a production of America Media. I'm your host, Michael O'Loughlin. This series was written and produced by me and Eloise Blondio. The executive producer is Sebastian Gomes. Thanks to the team at America Media who helped make this series happen. Carrie Weber and Father Sam Sawyer, Colleen Dully, Tucker Redding, Robert David Sullivan, and Isabel Seneschal and Anna Marchese. Sound design by Rebecca Seidel. Original music by Christopher McCormick. Art by Sean Tripoli and Allison Hamilton. Parts of this series were recorded in the William J. Loeschert Studio at America Media in New York. This podcast was made possible by the generosity of Mark A. McDermott and Yuval David, whose gift honors and supports all LGBTQ plus persons and allies, past and present. As we close out this series, let me again thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends and leave a review wherever you listen. That will help others find our work. And consider a donation to America Media. There's a big team behind Plague, and we want to bring you more content like this. Visit americamag.org slash donate. And as always, let me know what you think by following me on Twitter at Mike O'Loughlin. Thanks for listening. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org.